practicing for 29 years, um, board certified, and he's been doing life care planning as well. Um, he has a degree in physics and electrical engineering and psychology, and um, you did your medical training in New York, and then residency in St. Louis, fellowship in uh, neurovascular and skull-based surgery in Phoenix, Arizona, and then um, clinical assistant professor for 10 years uh, at the University of Texas Medical School at Houston, medical director in the past at um, Memorial Hermann, which is one of the major hospital systems in Houston, and top doctor in multiple areas, and he's also just written a book. So this is very exciting, um, a book about traumatic brain injury, a neurosurgeon's perspective, and it's gonna be published in a few weeks. So he is like amazing wealth of information, so I wanna get started so we can hear as much as possible. So welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Iverson. I, oh, sorry. Uh, if I live up to a half of that, I, I will be happy. But thank you, you're very kind. So it's a really great pleasure to be here. I'm speaking with this esteemed group, and I'm very uh, honored to be invited. And I want to thank several people, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Iverson, uh, for your leadership and inviting me to speak. Also, Ms. Contreras and Ms. Erica Gonzalez, also uh, for all the work and dedication you've done to also organize and help me uh, with this. i uh, also like to thank Dr. May, because the book that is coming out in a few weeks, uh, it's, and I'll show you a little bit about it, it wouldn't have happened without Dr. May, because Dr. May had asked me, I was writing two chapters for a textbook, a multi-authored uh, book that he's editing, coming out, and I wrote one on peripheral neuropathy, and I wrote one on traumatic brain injury, and I just couldn't stop with writing about TBI. Finally, the publisher, so Dr. May said, well, this is too long, and the publisher asked, can you shorten it, but we'd like to publish a book on what you wrote uh, from the chapter, and said, I put a lot more work into it, and I'm excited about it coming out. But I'm really delighted to talk with you here today, because as a neurosurgeon, I see tremendous amount of things from pain, spine, other things, and we know what catastrophic injuries are a lifelong problem for patients, but much of spine that we do, fortunately, we're able to fix it, and the patients get better. With brain injury, a very different situation. I think brain injury is very pertinent for everything we're doing here today. So, um, as I say, just uh, a little, just a housekeeping. This isn't medical or legal advice, and uh, for those, we need to contact a personal physician or attorney. But I'm going to start with one of the later slides in this talk and go over. It's mesmerizing how many individuals are needed to treat uh, TBI. The number of symptoms, diagnoses, tests, complications, specialists, the number of permutations and combinations of this is astronomical. But rather than get into the nitty gritty of each one, I'd love to like to present a tree trunk, a broad framework with which we can put on little pieces later. I don't want to dive into every leaf and every little twig, but rather build the tree trunk the details are on the slides, and this talk there's a lot of details, we're gonna go through a lot of things, but let's look at more like we're flying in an airplane over terrain. We're not gonna worry about every little thing. Those are in the slides. If there's any questions, my email is in the back. You can contact me, ask me questions. I love talking about the brain, so I'm happy to talk with people. But I wanna just take us on a tour. As a neurosurgeon, every time I've looked at the brain, I'm mesmerized at it, and I wanna show why TBI and the brain is different than treating any other organ in the body. So we understand it's a silent epidemic. Um, tremendous. Just last night, I was speaking with a, uh, Olymp with a major skier who, at the age of 22, was going for a, a world record on some kind of a double backward flip skiing in Vancouver, struck the head, eight hemorrhages, and I was speaking uh, with her. She underwent five years of uh, cognitive training, neuroplasticity, and has done remarkably well. But she even told me, the reason that it's, it's under-recognized, it's silent. There are people walking around that don't recognize they've had it. So I want to go through some of the framework of these. Being aware of the types of TBI is critical. Also, a TBI, traumatic brain injury, can make us more susceptible to future injury. And that's critical for us to understand. And also, we realize even a small change in how we're functioning now, amplify that over 10 years, has dramatic impact. So as I say, I'd like to pre present a broad framework 
of the brain, the abnormally functioning brain, understand what assessments and tools are needed, and then we're going to discuss how we as uh, life care planners can uh, anticipate future needs and costs. But of course, well, the brain is the, probably one of the most, if not the most complex machines, if we'll call it, in the universe. So anything we do is uh, an attempt to understand it. But the way I look to look at any complex problem, we look at any problem we analyze on the ground and up in the sky and at every level in between, because we can't see from the ground what we can see from the sky, and we can't see from the sky what we can see from the ground. So we have to be able to go to every layer in between and analyze those. So I, the way I look at it is the brain, yes, we get to subatomic particles, and core, but let's start at maybe neurons, dendrites. We escalate to cortical regions of the brain, then the interconnections of the brain. Then what the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Wiener, was actually talking about, things like large-scale networks, default mode networks. Then we inject some mystery, some magic, uh, and we suddenly, a vitalism, we get to the, our consciousness. So that's the same type of slide. So when, why is TBI different than any other injury? If I fracture my foot, I'm the same person. I have a fractured foot, I'm the same person. I fracture my hip, the same person. Herniated, this is the same person. When I have a TBI, I'm no longer the same person. And I've had many patients come in. Just last week, I saw a patient, a husband and wife, and this is typical. I'll ask the patient that's injured, do you have any change in personality? They'll say, no, not really. The spouse will look in dismay. I mean, I can't believe this. This is not the person I married. This is a different person. We have to understand that. So. When we look at the brain, why is it different? We have to understand and want to take us through the eyes of an injured patient because our thoughts, language, perception, concentration, ambition, interpersonal relationships, hopes, dreams, everything that resides in the brain. The body is really supporting the brain. So the brain is very different and after a brain injury, life may never be the same. We have to adjust to a new normal and we understand that no two TBIs are the same. So there are a myriad of symptoms that can happen, but I'd like to, as I said, go through a framework a little bit. So a bit about background about, uh, and Dr. Iverson was very kind and I greatly appreciate it, but just a bit about background because we all are a product of our experiences. So my undergraduate training was initially in physics and electrical engineering. I did a stint of some work at IBM and, and uh, on some uh, handwriting recognition, et cetera. And then I did my training in medicine. Uh, I did residency in neurosurgery, fellowship in vascular skull base surgery, and I'm a life care planner. So that's my formal training. But most of my real on-the-job training has been taking care of patients. And I've learned from my patients, and I thank them for that. So I'm going to share a few cases. So a long time ago, I took care of two uh, brothers. They were in a severe motorcycle crash. They were in the ICU for a long time, had pressure monitors in the brain. They were on ventilators, severe injuries. Six months or so later, they come back with their mother. I, I couldn't believe what I'm hearing. The mother said before she was worried about them. They were always uh, in and out of problems with the law, ruckus, causing issues. Now they just sit in front of the TV. They watch TV. She tells them to get up and take out the garbage. They get up, take out the garbage, sit back, watch TV. Classic ebulia, almost like you know the bifrontal lobotomies that we saw from some of the movies that we know in the past. Another patient. Large frontal meningioma, not a tumor, not a trauma rather, but severe edema in the frontal lobes. I get a call six in the morning, the nurse's station patches me through the police department. Uh, the patient would be examined at 5.30 in the morning just before surgery uh, because they had lost judgment from the swelling of the meningioma, called the police. They thought the medical student evaluating them was a criminal trying to uh, do something uh, inappropriate with them or so. Another patient came in, the malfunctioning shunt patient. Late in the afternoon, uh, I see this patient. The patient had a shunt placed elsewhere. It was malfunctioning, severe hydrocephalus. I was worried about that patient leaving the office. The patient was, I said, we need to get you out of the hospital. We need to repair the shunt. I was worried the patient would have a problem or die if they left. The patient was belligerent, angry, didn't want to come to the hospital. I finally got security. We managed to, I don't have power of attorney over them, but we managed to convince them to come to the hospital. I repaired the shunt, two days later they're ready to leave. The friendliest person, I said, do you remember being so belligerent and angry? He said, I don't remember any of that, I'm very sorry. So 
when we talk about TBI, we think about somebody coming in a car injury or an explosion, but every operation I've done is an iatrogenic TBI. We retract in the brain, we incise into the brain, we take out lobes of the brain, we put tubes in the brain. Everything we do is a TBI. And we try in neurosurgery to do everything to protect the brain as well we can. So for instance, every aspect of positioning the brain during craniotomy so that when I drain out the spinal fluid, the, sp uh, the lobe will retract on its own without me having to retract. Doing wide dissection of fissures so I don't have to force a retraction. Sharp dissection, instead of pulling, I very sharply under the microscope cut every fiber. Even on aneurysms, I have to temporarily clip a vessel. That means no blood flow to that part of the brain while you're dissecting the aneurysm. Or even, there's some aneurysms we have to do under cardiac standstill. We, we stop the heart completely because there's no way to get proximal control. How do we protect the brain? We have medications that we can use. We cool the patient, maybe down to 13 degrees Celsius before we stop the heart. It's like the children being fished out of a frozen pond. Here, we don't see it much, but when I was up north, I see a lot of kids coming in, fished out of a frozen pond up to an hour, but they can do well. So, and we try to use as non-eloquent corridors as possible. But we have to realize, if I get a kidney transplant, I benefit. If I get a lung transplant, I benefit. If I get a brain transplant, somebody else benefits <laughs> because they're getting a new body. So this is the, the textbook that uh, Dr. Iverson mentioned. It's coming out in a few weeks, uh, published by Routledge. They already show it on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all of the uh, outlets. And a tremendous joy writing to my perspective on brain. And I have one area in life care planning as well. The others is a, a atlas using three dimension, comes with view master reels, of most of the approaches on the brain. But the other two are novels. Uh, they're co-authored with Dr. Pop, Co novels on brain injury, because as I say, when we talk about a body trade instead of brain transplantation, these are TBI novels with the talks about brain transplantation as well, because when we transplant a brain, it's really the body that we're trading. And the uh, dedication in the book, this tra trauma brain injury book, is dedicated, as I say, to the patients that I've cared for. I have, they have taught me so much about life, Medicine, courage, and humanity. And we learn from all our patients. Those are our really ultimate teachers. So when we talk about biomarkers, we ask, is there a, you know, a, a definite marker showing, ah, this is brain injury? Well, the marker is each of us. Is doctors looking and talking and evaluating and understanding the patient. That's the best biomarker. We may have headaches. We may have confusion, our vision may be off, we may have problems at work, we can't keep up, we're angry, we have trouble sleeping, our social interaction is off. Post-its, I have many patients tell me I put post-its all over. They say, that some patients even tell me I used to put these into my phone, but I forget to check my phone. We may have clumsiness. As I say, we're not the same person after we had a brain injury. So, what is a TBI? TBI can be anything from a severe impact of objects striking the skull to just acceleration, deceleration, rotation, penetrating injury, gunshot wounds, explosions. Why is the brain so susceptible? We know the brain is housed, as we know, in a firm, hard skull. It's partitioned, the lobes of the brain are partitioned by these firm dural membranes. Those membranes are great for supporting and protecting the brain but they're not so great when we have a trauma, because when we have a trauma, the brain keeps moving, but those membranes, the falx, the tentorium, the skull, they stop. So the brain, the soft tissue, three pounds slams into it, rotates, shears, tremendous injury to the brain. So the um, CDC definition, so CDC definition of a, uh, a traumatic brain injury, so disruption of normal function of the brain caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head. And as we see, traumatic brain injury is a global problem, transcends all economic boundaries, and it's one of the most costly problems in the world. Now, when somebody has a brain injury, there are two events that happen. There's the primary, the in initial insult to the brain, traumatic shearing of tissue in the brain. Then there's the subsequent secondary problem with their swelling, spasm, ischemia, release of neurotransmitters, and this is a downward cascading process in which ultimately can take hours, days, and weeks, ultimately leading to neuronal death and patient death. But when we see a normal CAT scan, does that mean there's no brain injury? No. 
And we'll get into a lot of this. So as we see, we classify generally brain injury, civilian injury, military injury, sports injury. Of civilian injury, the majority is mild, and we'll go into the details of that because uh, it's very under-recognized. Uh, mortality of mild is very low, 1%, but the morbidity, the complications, how it impacts a life, very severe. That's a big problem. The moderate, and we know the mortality, morbidity of severe is very high. And those are more easily recognizable, but 80% is mild, and it's very under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-appreciated, and under-treated. And that's, I think, a very important area for all of us as well. And we see about one to three million cases of TBI a year, about 10% are hospitalized. And we can see if those hospitalized, those are the moderate and severe ones, very bad outcomes, significant death and long-term disability. And as we say, when we break down TBI in civilians, the majority are falls met, followed by motor vehicle collisions or objects striking the patient. Military, the majority are blast injuries, and those tend to be more moderate and severe. And as we say, TBI-related deaths, about one-third of all injury deaths in the United States. It's more frequent in the younger and the older because of less strength and stability issues. And, and as I say, in the older than 75, about 50% of cases are a result of falls. So we also see, interestingly, in sports, under-reporting of TBI. Why is that? Because several reasons. One is education, knowledge about it, but also they're very motivated to get the back to play, and they know if they report a TBI, they're gonna be taken out. So any tool that we use in life, medicine is no different. We look at these parameters on any measurement we do, whether it's a scan, a blood test, anything. So let's take a look, for instance, just at a CAT scan and mild TBI. Is it sensitive? No. A lot of mild TBI, CAT scan is totally normal. We don't, it doesn't pick up that small shearing. Is it specific? Yes. In other words, when we see blood on a CAT scan, that patient did have an injury. So it's very specific. Is it reliable, repeatable? Yes, if we do a scan now and in another hour, yes, we're gonna see the same uh, hemorrhage. And is it valid? Does it show what it's intended to show? Yes. Once we see a hemorrhage, it's pretty well conclusive that it is a hemorrhage. But we look for these biomarkers. I always get back to when we're in medical school, we're taught that most of the diagnosis comes from the history, some from the physical exam, and then a little bit from these <clears throat> fancy tests. You know, in spine, I can't say that's totally true because I need an MRI to know, is it a herniated disc, a spondylolisthesis, a fracture, foraminal narrowing, where is it? We need imaging, we rely heavily on it. But when it comes to TBI, we're back to medical school, a lot of the diagnosis comes from talking with the patient, the family, seeing what changed. That's critical. And I remember in medical school, my first year, a little while ago, I, uh, we, I don't know if they still do, I got a free Lilly stethoscope. I think it was 1999, but we got a free Lilly stethoscope. And then some students said, I want to buy this Littman cardiology. I remember this nice, elegant scope. So I asked the cardiologist, should I buy the Littman cardiology scope? And the cardiologist said, says, Gary, when you're listening to the patient's heart, it's not what's outside the ears, it's what's between the ears, inside here, that analyzes. <laughs> and I think that's true with TBI. Now, there are, of course, imaging, and we'll get into it, but it's ultimately listening to the patient. I want to go over these subtle things that we do. But so some of the things we're important to ask are gait, memory, aphasia, expressive, understanding. When you ask patients, you get answers. Patients may not even recognize. You might ask a patient or anything, oh, I'm perfectly fine. And you go down the list and they've got problems in every single aspect. And you ask, I always like to have a family member come so I can see what were they like before? What changed? Important enough, in some big case, I've been asked to do now a case of a young child, I get to the point where I'm talking with the kindergarten teacher, I'm uh, trying to get an ARD meeting with the school district, the first grade teacher, uh, speech language pathologist, so all of these things. So, Personality changes, anxiety, impact on work, all of these things are critical. Uh, and then, as I say, change in taste, smell, difficulty, fogginess of thinking. So in order to understand the brain, let's first try to understand just a working brain. And this has mesmerized people for thousands of years, of course. They're going back to 5,000 years ago, there are references to the brain in the war journals on the papyrus from e Egypt. It wasn't until... Uh, then uh, came to Aristotle, he talked about something called, called an entelechy, a vitalism that 
in each of us. But we didn't, they didn't know where that was. Is it the heart? Is it the brain? Gall, whose theories are debunked, came up with phrenology, said bumps on the head are related to cognitive. It wasn't until 1906 that two anatomists, Golgi and Santiago Ramoni Cajal, won the Nobel Prize for, they came up with the Golgi, the silver stain, that allowed us to look at neurons and understand and came up with the neuron doctrine of uh, the thinking. Then after that, Brodman came up with these areas. We've heard of Brodman areas of the brain, different regions of the brain. And now, 100 years later, we're talking about tensors and network connections. And as previous uh, Dr. Wiener talked default mode network. We've gone more in one century than in 5,000 years. But in order to try to grasp this incredibly complex machine, if we're even capable of grasping it, and I go into that a little bit in the book, so because there are a lot of physicists, and quantum physicists, have, have uh, talked a lot about consciousness, and uh, probably a different reason. But in order to really understand the brain, we need certainly the medical specialties, neurosurgery, radiology. We also need mathematics and big data, because putting these big connectomes together takes that. We need psychiatry, but we need also religion, physics, philosophy, all of these things. So there are only 13 ways information gets into our brain. Our brain is just sitting in the skull, and it comes through the 12 cranial nerves and the spinal cord. That's it. Everything that we hear, we see, it's just us processing impulses. So we have the five senses coming in through receptor organs. We use those receptor organs we hope are working properly. We hope all our connections are working internally. And then we formulate thoughts, and that's how we perceive the world. Any problem with that, and we perceive the world incorrectly. So this is my own diagram, and so I'm not sure if it's any standard, but that's how I kind of see the brain. This yellow triangle represents the brain. We will never understand it. But we start at the base. We have 100 billion neurons. I start from the lower, the cellular level, and we work our way up. We have 100 billion neurons, 100 glial, billion glial cells, 168, 180 trillion connections, thousands of synapses per neuron, a processing speed, if calculable, of 52 quadrillion bits per second. And then we go next level to cortical regions. Next is the networks connecting. Next, we add that magic that we don't know. And then suddenly, we arrive at consciousness. And the only way we can try to figure out what's going on here is anatomical dissections post-mortem on normal and disease states, <coughs> studies comparing those, and asking our patient history, physical, and doing tests. So this is a textbook I wrote previously. It's most of the approaches on the brain that a neurosurgeon does. It comes with 32 view master reels because what the beauty, uh, and I'll show you here, what the beauty of the stereo is, people, the microscope for a neurosurgeon functions with three things. Yes, it magnifies, but it also provides light in a very small opening. But most critical, it allows you to see in 3D. Because unlike abdominal surgery, where you can move the bowel, you don't have that luxury in the brain. I can't move the optic nerve over to clip an aneurysm because the patient will go blind. So you're in your mind's eye, have to see in 3D all the time. And Interestingly, if you look at this slide, you can see in 3D, not easy to do, but you can cross your eyes, and you'll see two images on the side, one in the center, and that one in the center is 3D. But what I want everybody to appreciate on this, when we look at the image on the left and the image on the right, that's what our eyes see. We're so used to, we see the world in 3D, but it's our mind putting together two images. If you look, they're slightly different parallax and orientations. Every second, our mind is putting together two completely different images and just processing it, and we see 3D. The same with sound, when we hear a car coming towards us, Doppler effect, that's uh, the car coming, the noise is higher, when it leaves away, the pitch is lower. Only way we know is our mind processing all this. It's so complex, but we take it for granted, and it works until it doesn't. So that's why this is also a critical, but I want to point out also here, um, there's a few things that I think are very uh, pertinent here. So this is looking under the right frontal lobe. I've taken off the skull, and I've retracted a bit on the temporal lobe, the frontal lobe. So this isn't the nice surface of the brain where everybody's used to seeing with the crinkles. And uh, This is underneath the skull base. And this is one of the most common approaches for aneurysm clipping, the right optic nerve. This little band, all the function from the right optic nerve. This little wisp of tissue is one is the oculomotor nerve, third cranial nerve, one of three nerves that controls eye movement. Why does a pupil herni dilate when a patient herniates the brain? We all know about the dilating pupil. Because the fibers that constrict the pupil lie on the outside. 
So when the temporal lobe compresses this into the tentorium, it compresses the nerve and the pupil dilates. This little wisp is the pituitary stalk we'll get into, and these little tiny perforating arteries, a millimeter or less, go to the thalamus, the hypothalamus. Injury to any one of them can cause uh, damage to the brain. And we realize those critical areas, the limbic system, everything, are just centimeters away from here. So that's why the brain is so susceptible. So we'll go through it. So again, one other thing, and then we'll dive into other areas. This is uh, taken off the back of the spinal canal. So this is the cervical spinal cord going up into the brain stem. Maybe the diameter of a quarter, every passage of information from the body travels through this small area. This is the seat of our soul. This is consciousness, the base of the uh, brain stem. This little wisp is the final portion of the accessory nerve. This allows us to turn our heads, turn our platter muscle muscles, and shrug our shoulder, trapezius. So when we look at that, and we see how delicate it is, we can start to understand how easy it is to traumatize and damage everything. So as I said, we've discussed this, but the statistics of the brain are beyond imagination, comprehension. So the way I like to look at the brain is like looking at the city of Houston. Well, I should put San Antonio, I'm sorry. But we have destinations. We have homes, malls, schools, places of work. Nothing matters unless we connect everything. So the highways, the roads, connect everything for us. So again, we start at the small, we start neurons, cortical regions of the brain, white matter connections, networks, then some magic, and suddenly we're at consciousness. So we start at the microscopic, the neurons. Very small, thousands of synapses each. We know the lobes of the brain. We know they have different functioning, the lobe frontal, movement, behavior, other aspects, parietal lobe, sensation, temporal lobe, uh, language, occipital lobe, vision, limbic lobe, dealing with emotion, memory, brainstem, thalamus. How do we learn about injuries? Unfortunately, it's through injured patients. You know, and then we didn't know until 1848 the frontal lobes were so critical for uh, emotion and uh, functioning and behavior. Phineas Gage was a railroad worker, worked in Vermont, and they drilled holes, 25-year-old, drilled holes in the rock, put gunpowder and tamped it down, and then ignited it to blast the rock. Unfortunately, when he tamped down, there was a spark. It, it, it uh, sent the tamping rod through behind the left orbit. From what I understand, bits of bone and brain were splattering out. He had a seizure, lost consciousness. They repaired it, took him back to his hotel room. He got infected, went to coma, went to the hospital. Two months later, he's out walking the street. Only now, unlike a dedicated, responsible employee in the railroad, he's an angry, unpleasant person. He lost his job, lost his family, lost everything. That's when we first learned. So we have, as we know, different lobes of the brain, as we discussed, that are responsible for different primary functions. But then we have what are called association areas. This is where the higher processing occurs. And we'll go into that. So the vision, yes, we have vision, but then we have association areas. And I want to just discuss here, um, again, just let's look at a couple of things. Sensory cortex. Yes, it's responsible for tactile, pressure, position, sense. But the association cortex, which is next to that, is, takes that information from the primary sensory cortex, processes it further. That's the higher cognitive functioning, where we look at similarities, differences, spatial relationships, changes in weight, other subtle changes. Those are critical. And this is an oversimplification. It's not really precisely accurate, but generally we think of the right side of the brain, the intuition, feeling, uh, and the left side more analytical or so. But then, let's say, next we get past the cortical regions to networks. Now, as we say, a city is just a bunch of places. Without the connectivity, it, they don't mean anything. But the connectivity makes it greater than the sum of the parts. And the same with the brain. The connectivity is what's critical, what gives us. So this is one of the old dissections, Klingler method, where you actually dissect out the white matter. By the way, the reason it's called white matter, when you cut the brain in brain cutting or so, you have a thin layer of cortex, the gray matter, why is the white, most of the brain is just all these massive connections, and it's white because fat is white, and the glial cells have a lot of myelin and have fat in them. This is the white matter, this is a tensor representation of white matter, and without worrying about the details, we classify fire projection of white matter just into three types. Projection go from the top down to the brain stem and body, association go in the same hemisphere, and, and commercial 
uh, cross sides. And we have again here these superhighways of the brain, like the uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus. And a few major tracts, corticospinal, again, movement from the brain goes down to the body, very important white matter tract, spinothalamic, the opposite sends it from the uh, legs and the body up to the brain. Then we have the thalamus. This is a relay station that gets sensory input from every part of the body except the olfactory tract. And it also has some motor. And this is a massive relay station. Anything that wants to go from one part of the brain to the, it passes through the thalamus generally. We have the autonomic, things we don't have to think about, blood pressure, breathing. The eye is very critical for traumatic brain injury. Why? Let's look at all the uh, important information. We need the eye, the globes, the peripheral organs to be working. The optic nerves have to work. The thalamus has to work. The occipital cortex has to work. The frontal lobes have to work to move the eyes. And also, the brain stem is critical because to have that perfect yoke movement, so we see in stereo, anytime the third nerve or the abducens nerve, the sixth nerve moves at one eye outward, the other one has to move inward. And that's all connected by this medial longitudinal fasciculus, like a yoke movement. So any kind of disruption is a major interruption. Balance the same. We always wonder about balance. Is it due to the external, the peripheral, and the temporal bone, semicircular canals? But there's a tremendous amount of central connections. And these also connect to the nerves that control eye movement. Because we know when we do doll's eyes or move the eyes, cold water calorics, when we rotate the uh, fluid in the semicircular canals, the eyes move. So it's all very interconnected. So we're always wondering with any malfunction of these, especially vision or balance, is it central or is it peripheral? Then again, the limbic system, emotion, memory, and we get what the previous speaker, Dr. Wiener, uh, talked about, these large scale networks. As you mentioned, the default node network, the resilience network. So what do these networks do? These are at a much higher level. For instance, we're talking here, we're discussing. Let's say there's a car alarm goes off half a mile away and we hear this alarm. Suddenly, we'll turn our attention to that alarm, we'll recognize this is not a threat to our safety, and then we'll put it out and we'll focus again. If those networks are injured, a person can no longer work in a call center, no longer work in an office. That outside noise allows them, to can't, they can't concentrate with that. So these are critical networks. And these higher large scale networks that are really relatively recently discovered, constantly being uh, uh, researched. The knowledge about them is still very primitive. So, we see that when we're talking now about the white matter connections, we get into another area called lesion network mapping, where it's, yes, if we have an injury to the cortex, it's important, but if we have an injury to any of the networks connecting the brain, that may be as important or more important. Now, when it comes to TBI, as I say, the nomenclature is unfortunately bad. Mild to me means mild. Mild hot sauce, I'm not afraid of it. I, I have, this, have a neuro, I, I never do that experience again. But, um, and then mild weather, you know, we think mild. Again, Miriam Webster says mild, gentle in nature, moderate in action, not severe, but that's not the case with mild TBI. Mild TBI, CAT scan's usually negative, but may have severe neurocognitive, behavioral, emotional issues for life. We know, all know the Glasgow Coma Scale. This was developed by Jeanette and Teasdale in 1974 with their seminal paper, and it's a wonderful, scale to do a standardized, simple test around the world for decades on everybody that enters an emergency room so you can write papers and analyze in the emergency setting. Very simple to use. But it's not good for TBI, for mild TBI, and it's not good for outcomes. And the Department of Defense criteria, there are many, there are sports medicine, other societies have their own criteria, but the, generally mild TBI is very misunderstood. Many times people think you need to lose consciousness, you don't. As we see the Department of Defense, confused, disoriented state, less than 24 hours, loss of consciousness up to 30 minutes, memory loss up to 24 hours. So many patients experience TBI, they put it off, they don't recognize it, and we don't recognize it, but the consequences are severe. Um, outcome scales, we're familiar with these. One of the most commonly used is the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended, but there are many others. Some are observer-based, some are patient-based. And the range of deficits that we can have after TBI is innumerable. And we'll get into a little bit more of them, but it can be anything, for, certainly from coma to paraplegia, paralysis, balance issues, speech, or just emotional, behavioral, and there's no end to it. Now, question here. The, I want to see everybody's thought. The corpus callosum 
is the largest white matter fiber in the brain. 250 million fibers connecting both hemispheres. What would people think if I damaged or cut that in half? Would we think we'd have a major cognitive change, a major, we would be able to know this for sure. But we would be wrong. So Roger Sperry, a neuroscientist, won the Nobel Prize in 1981. He wasn't the surgeon, but he was a scientist. There are patients, unfortunately, that have intractable seizures. They have drop attacks, 20 or 30 a day. If they're not responsive to medications, they can't do anything. Because once the seizure generalizes across the corpus callosum, they lose consciousness and drop. Can't do anything. So this is surgery. I've done it in the past, where you split the corpus callosum, separating the two halves so it doesn't generalize. But Dr. Sperry, Roger Sperry found he has Nobel Prize winning, no definite symptoms detected after surgery, even with extensive neurological and psychological tests. Now, if you wanted to detect this, what you would do is have the patient look straight ahead, show an object in the left visual field, they'll see it in the right occipital, show it in the right, and you ask, have you seen it before? And they'll say no, because it didn't cross the corpus callosum, the information. So when we come to these disconnection syndromes, if we can miss such a major one, what about these smaller ones? And I have one chapter devoted to this just to call agnosias, aphasias, apraxias, agraphias. These are subtle disconnection syndromes. For instance, prosopagnosia, inability to recognize faces that's been localized to a uh, fusiform gyrus. Another one, this is taking out, I think it was one of the journals from England, a patient with a right thalamic hemorrhage, paralyzed on the left side. When they showed that she was paralyzed, had what's called anosognosia, inability to recognize their own paralysis, but in addition, they had somatoparaphrenia. They thought that the arm belonged to her sister. And there were cases of people throwing their leg out of bed. It was so why do you keep throwing your left leg out of bed? Because it's not mine, it belongs to somebody else. These are real. Anton Babinski syndrome. People used to thought these people are schizophrenic, other. When you damage the occipital pole, the visual cortex, as we mentioned, you'll be cortically blind, you can't see. But if you damage the association area around that, you won't know that you're blind. So you'll confabulate. People were thought to have schizophrenia, other problems, but no, this is a real syndrome, Anton Babinski syndrome. Interestingly though, when you shine a light, even cortical blind, you shine a light, the pupils will still react. It's a different pathway. Visual agnosia, Oliver Sacks, a neurologist in New York in Manhattan, wrote a book, Man Who Mistook His Wife for His Hat. 24 chapters, excellent book. Chapter one, he talks about Dr. P. Dr. P is a conductor of a symphony orchestra in New York. He examined them, he had a visual agnosia. They go out to the waiting room, and Dr. P, the conductor of symphony, grabs his wife's head. He thought his wife's head was a hat. That's the name of the book. It's, a, I think, around 1985 written. Men who mistook his wife for a hat. There's Capgras delusion, where individual claims their spouse has been replaced by an alien. These are subtle things. Now, it doesn't mean they don't recognize their spouse. Not recognizing is another agnosia. And as I say in that chapter, I list about 160 of these agnosias and the places in the brain that we know where they're responsible. But it's not that you don't recognize your spouse, but you don't have that emotional. You don't think that's really your spouse. You think it's, it looks like your spouse, but it's been replaced. So there are many, many others. So as I said, when we come with any subtle agnosia or any subtle finding, I see we see the tip of the iceberg. If we find one of these subtle things, it means there's much, much more. So what kind of, what can imaging help us? We know CAT scan is good for moderate and severe. For mild TBI, not very helpful. We have other types of MRI, traditional, conventional MRI, not very helpful for mild TBI. Of course, the more severe ones it is. So, but mild, we really, that's where we really also need to understand more because it can have significant problems for life. There is other uh, imaging called diffusion tensor, we'll discuss briefly. That's better to look at the white matter fiber tract. SWI, susceptibility weighted, looks at hemosiderin, very good for detecting iron and others. Uh, there's uh, other types, functional spin labeling. The segmental, the volumetric, allows us, uh, this one, to actually evaluate a patient where they can act as their own control. So if I see a progressive volume change over the course of six months, a year, two years, I can say, this is from the injury, because we often say, how do we know this wasn't pre-existing? But if a person has a progressive volume change, we can attribute. There's functional ones like magnetoencephalogram and others that are very fascinating. We hear a lot of word, time the word diffusion tensor imaging. I'm sure everybody's heard of these words. What actually is a tensor? So I'll just go briefly. So if I put water in a glass, water will diffuse like a sphere. So what isotropy means equal in all directions. And isotropy means not equal in all directions. So this fractional goes from zero to one. Water diffuses randomly. It's isotropic has no anisotropy, so it's uh, fractional anisotropy is a zero. If it's like a tube, like in a spaghetti or so, then it's a fractional anisotropy closer to one. 
Now, when we put together the scalar, the amount of diffusion, plus a vector, the direction of it, that's what a tensor is. A scalar multiplied by a vector is a tensor. And this is very good for white matter fibers because the white matter is just like spaghetti tubes. But when it's damaged, the water no longer, the axons are damaged, so more like a spaghetti tube, that, uh, the, uh, it more diffuses. So the conventional is red is right to left, green is front to back, blue is top to bottom, fibers tracking. And when it goes yellow and pink, that's when it's uh, taking some mixture of cult. And then we, as, as I said, just a, one slide on neurosurgical procedures. We have the traditional surgery for epidural, subdural hematomas, and we're all the time putting uh, moderate and severe pressure monitors and other tubes into the brain. Now talking a little bit about recovery. After symptoms occur and they last more than three months, they become a syndrome. DSM-4, DSM-5 touch upon this, but DSM-4 considered it in research category. They removed it for DSM-5, so I think some papers actually still refer to DSM-4. DSM-4 calls it post-concussional disorder. DSM-5, mild or major neurocognitive disorder due to traumatic brain injury. But again, these symptoms, and the details we have in the slides, and we can always go, but there's a lot on this, but the generally, oops, I'm sorry, generally into somatic, things in the body, imbalance, headache, dizziness, cognitive, executive functioning, thinking, and emotional, behavioral, psych psychological, PTSD. And the list is innumerable, but these are some of the major questions that we ask patients about personality, other things, fogginess that we discussed a little bit. So when we look at the statistics of mild TBI, mild TBI, a quarter of the patients still have three or more symptoms at one year, and 82% of the patients have one symptom still at a year, and 22% uh, of mild TBI are still below full functional status. With severe TBI, the outcome is much, much worse. And, and as I say, I think the slides are prepared, but if anybody is looking to always send you the slides or any questions or so, please. So the outcome of vegetative Bad outcomes, death is much higher with moderate and certainly severe. And severe TBI, as I say, have very dire outcomes. I can go see, but we can see vegetative states, severe death, very, very tragic on severe TBI. Post-traumatic headaches, if they occur the last more than three months, they're considered persistent post-traumatic headaches, and they can take various types of patterns, certainly. And then seizures, if a seizure occurs very early, in the, like the first day, immediate seizure, not so much a concern, may not occur, but after about a week, these late seizures, what are called post-traumatic epilepsy, unprovoked seizures, they're more likely to have seizures in the future. And a risk of a severe TBI, as they say, increases the risk of seizures 30-fold. So why is injury so uh, common to have all of these psychological and cognitive? Because the temporal bone and the frontal fossa have all of these grooves, and when the brain slams in an injury into these, those uh, almost in a cone of rotation, a cone of injury, happens that all of these frontal areas, the limbic system, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, gets severely injured. And that's why we have so much behavioral. So neuropsychology plays an important role in understanding a little bit more about cognition and also then what kind of cognitive rehabilitation and therapy to do. And we also traditionally have the pencil paper test that traditionally takes six hours or more for a patient to do. And we have also the computerized test. Interestingly, for the last probably 15 or more years, every person entering the military, every, uh, everyone takes the ANAM test, A-N-A-M, it's a computerized test. Most sports, professional sports take impact. It's a different computerized test. They're fast, they're standardized. Each one has its pros and cons. But let's get, the, we discussed a little bit balance difficulties, visual changes, sleep disturbances, headaches, seizures. But what I'd like to touch upon here is, for a second, why do we have endocrine problems? 20 to 40% of people after moderate or severe TBI have endocrine disorder. Oops. Oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, as I say, moderate to severe TBI, 20 to 40% of people have endocrine dysfunction. We won't know unless we ask for it. Well, why would we imagine endocrine dysfunction? So look, this is the pituitary gland. This is that same picture up front, what we showed earlier. This is the skull base. The pituitary gland sits in the cell of Tarsica, firmly affixed in the skull base. That's not going anywhere. But when a traumatic brain injury occurs, the brain sloshes around. This is the pituitary stalk coming up under the optic chiasm to the hypothalamic region and others. We can see when the brain is rocking around, this is going to be sheared and pulled. You know, it's, it's, it makes good sense that we're going to have these endocrine dysfunctions. You know, very... So, again, other issues, movement disorders, spasticity, swallowing, impact on caregivers, 
Chronic traumatic encephalopathy was really not understood until, as we know, the seminal paper of uh, Dr. Omalu in, in 2005, where he talked about these uh, football players who had chronic injuries to the brain, despite having grossly normal appearing brain, normal brain on MRI and CAT scans, had this severe, several phases of the CT, degenerative changes where, as we know, many of them even killed themselves. It just destroyed their life. And what it is, it's a tauopathy. Tau is a protein normally involved in the cells, in the act, but it converts in its form to what's called cis-tau. That is toxic to the brain. And it leads to chronic, even if you don't have another injury, in these states, chronic deterioration of the brain. Neuroplasticity is very important. You know, the age-old dogma is that nerve cells don't grow in the brain. They don't regenerate. That's actually not true. They do grow in the hippocampus and in the olfactory tract, but we don't know if it's functional growth. But what is important is synaptogenesis. And it's experience-based, and there's very good evidence for it. I think it's underappreciated, but it's a very important area, you know, and we were, you know, for the future, where people can grow new synapses. They can reorganize the brain. Imagine that map that we had of the city. We knock off I-10, the Katy Freeway in Houston. We're going to have collateral uh, methods. But every time we have another brain injury and knock off that next collateral, it's going to be hard. Finally, we're going to be going through back alleys to get through the traffic. So, but it is important. And, it, and as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, faith, hope, all of these things are critical. We need to improve in this area significantly. And then things for the future, stem cells, transcranial stimulation. Um, and I believe fully, how does this neuroplasticity work? The brain is very redundant. For instance, as a child, your toes are upgoing until a certain age. The reason they stop is because the frontal lobes, when they start to myelinate, and I have in the book some pictures of myelination of an infant, uh, zero months, six months, one year, two year. As the myelination progresses, the frontal lobes inhibit that upgoing plantar response of Babinski. Now, if you have somebody with an injured spinal cord, you'll see the toes upgoing because you don't have the inhibition. And there was a girl, 16-year-old girl, who had a frontal tumor removed, and she, three, she woke up paralyzed on the left. Three months later, full recovery. We would have thought, okay, the swelling went down, the edema went down, but she had a functional MRI before and after, and actually the left side of the brain now took over the function of the left foot. Wow. Not what we would normally expect, and we don't have these, that was a paper I, I cited in the book in 2022, it came out. Plasticity, there's probably so much redundancy in the brain, and we just allow the brain and help the brain to heal, it's very important. So, as we say, return to work, we see about 43% after uh, TBI, uh, have residual disability, and there's about three to five million Americans living with disability. And after mild TBI, we see the return to work rate at six months is about 74%. And importantly, those post concussive symptoms, CTSD, half of those patients won't return. Uh, when we talk about more severe, those have been in inpatient rehab, the outcome is much worse, of course. Many people unsatisfied with life, institutionalized, died, didn't return to fruitful work. And we can see here with people with a GCS score of six, uh, again, severe outcomes, 15% of those that survived, 15% uh, neurological disability, complaints of post-concussive symptoms, epilepsy, and depression and other issues. So as life care planners, we want to, of course, analyze, and this is from the uh, excellent uh, book from this organization, Dr. Gonzalez and other uh, uh, writers and authors, you know, that we want to quantify what can we attribute to the TBI. Now, I've had patient, I've had about a few weeks ago, a patient that um, had, uh, was on the spectrum, had um, Asperger's syndrome, but he was a high functioning and was able to remember every single thing. Now he can't. So, of course, somebody's going to say, well, he had Asperger's, he had autism, we're not. we have to quantify the difference. We have to, and sometimes that involves a lot of research, talking with people before and after this kind of analysis to really do a good job for our patients and for people who need our care. And then the associated costs. So as we say, how do we assess the economic? We have certainly collaboration with experts, and that can be even social workers, marriage counselors, also for the people. Life planners, it's important for us to do and understand the future needs. Vocational experts, on the other hand, they look at what are the changes in a person's aptitude and ability, and what is their lost earning potential, and then an economist takes that number and converts it to a present value, you know, through a discount rate or so, and establishes current losses. And we have to assess patients, optimize their function, reduce disability, and we recognize that when it's severe TBI, we may have a lifelong need.
So as I say, there's a very extensive list, and in the book it goes into much, much more detail, but you also have these slides, but every aspect from cognitive, behavioral, speech, uh, compensatory mechanism, the, it's endless because the brain controls everything. And we have to also realize there's no way to quantify the costs for future, but neuroplasticity, transcranial stimulation, all of these things are going to be no question useful. When we see where we came in one century versus 5,000 years, we can only imagine where we'll be in another century. So as I say, going back to one of the earlier slides, a tremendous variety of specialists are involved in the care. Uh, and I won't go through the name to all of you, but everything from physicians, nutritionists, social workers, rehabilitation, marriage counselors, case managers, and the outcomes from a patient will impact every part of the body. We'll have neurological issues, cranial nerve issues, balance issues, cognitive issues, emotional issues, um, family issues, social relationships, sleep disturbances, activity of daily living problems, loss of job, employment, and every other part of the body, as we say, from endocrine, metabolic, skin, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, genitourinary, and accelerated aging process. Important. Then other comorbidities. When we have degeneration of the brain, anything from dementia, sleep disorders, degenerative changes, sexual dysfunction, Integrate. And the last two are increased risk of the brain should they suffer a head injury in the future because the reflexes are slower and the balance is slower. We see that in sports a lot. And acceleration of the aging process. And it's remarkable in studies that have done on sports individuals, the vast majority of professional football players have signs of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So it's not a rare few, but there are four stages of it and somewhat maybe not in the advanced severe stage. And every year you play significantly increases the risk of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Then we can't forget care, assistance, skill, non-skill. That's a significant cost factor for future life care, as we know. Uh, you know, tremendous. Can people care for themselves? Long care, we have to remember things like yard maintenance. We can't assume collateral resources as life care planners, whether it's family, friends, wife, spouse. Everybody may leave. Maybe thus left with the pet. But we have to uh, you know, account for all of these. And then things at home, grab bars, others. So just two slides uh, left. One is the ethics of it. So the slide on the left is an epidural hematoma. I might take that out. The pa if we don't take it out, the patient may die already dilating a pupil. If we do take it out, the patient may go home in two days. Again, may have other cognitive changes, but relatively well. The slide on the right, is a different story. This patient is already well on the way to brain death, if not brain dead already. And one of the most difficult decisions and troubling things I've had over my career, and having seen lots of trauma in the past, is how to have these discussions with the family. No one knows how to predict, but I found it's my responsibility to take that burden off the family, because nobody wants to turn off the ventilator on their family and live with that guilt. But I found it's, and the way I train, it's, it's our, responsibility, at least I felt it's mine, to lift that burden and take that because we know what the outcomes will be. There are some cases I've done where I've saved the life, but the patient's in a permanently vegetative state. One patient that I took care of years ago remained in a vegetative state. Um, it was, she had what's called a coma vigil. It's a different term now. She was in a complete coma, but if in the room her eyes would track me. There's different phrases for that now. She had the years later, and this was in the New York Times, and she made the front cover, I think, of Newsweek. Uh, the family had got a Supreme Court decision from that state to have the feeding tube removed. So the question always is, are we doing the right thing? This is a tough thing to know. Very tough decision. It's very, it's very gut-wrenching and you know, really drains the heart when you see these things, especially young patients. And um, ethics of mild TBI. You know, mild TBI, as I said, is under-recognized, under-diagnosed. But there are a lot of reasons that people don't want to find this. But I think it's up to us, because if we don't recognize it, many people won't recognize it. A lot of medicine doesn't recognize it. Family, others don't recognize it. They would just say, well, there's something different about it. Well, they'll stay away. Or just, it's up to us to recognize. And it's interesting, I was having a long discussion yesterday and the, with the individual I mentioned, a, a skier that had a severe injury, and I was saying that really people don't recognize that, and people need to be aware, even employers, others. If somebody had an injury, they may put it off, but employers, other people need to know. We, we really owe it to ourselves and our patients to do better with that. But, um, 
And then, so I, I wanted to thank everybody. I hope I didn't go over too much. I did a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, actually, I'm just on time. You're perfect okay. on time. Yes. Perfect, perfect. So thank you so much, Dr. Yeah. 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 Yeah.